This is a talk about an application to a real world problem given by an academic, that's me, and it's meant to draw lessons for those of us who grow up in the academic world, teaching classes and publishing in the academic journals, how can we get successful applications in the real world? So the case study comes from the Ontario Power System, uh, centered in Toronto, Canada. And I am now a professor emeritus from the School of the Environment of Washington State University. So let's see if my slides will work. Okay, this is my website. Uh, it's for WSU, Washington State University. If you want to follow up on the things I talk about, visit my website and click on Energy Publications. The topic today is storage of electricity. Electricity is extremely difficult to storage, to store. Uh, I'm going to talk about an example where we store electricity energy in the form of compressed air in a cavern, where we run compressors to pump air into the cavern, and then perhaps during the day when electricity is very valuable, we release the air to run a generator and you'll notice that there's a windmill close by. Wind will play an important role. And indeed, storage, like compressed air and other forms, batteries, for example, have been promoted as the holy grail for renewables. Now, the most common form of storage uh, is pump storage. <clears throat> you have, I think you have some substantial pump storage in Brazil. These are proposed and operating sites in the United States. The number of proposed sites are huge compared to what we have already. Um, just for you, for some geographic background, that's my university in the state of Washington. I'm now retired and I live in sunny Colorado. The case study is for the province of Ontario in Canada. Storage proposals are exploding, but the question always lingers, does storage have significant value? There are many different ways the ability to store electric energy can be valuable, but the modes of value can be described qualitatively, but they are seldom modeled and quantified. The few attempts to quantify value usually show value less than half the cost of the facility. So this is a significant problem everywhere in North America, not just in um, Ontario. Now, this is a view of a, of a long-term system dynamics model. It's implemented in BenSim. You can see from the view of stack generation that it runs for 30 years. The storage facility uh, is not expected to be available for 10 years and it will operate for 20 years, so we have a 30-year time horizon. The main view is in to the right. The sliders show some of the things that can be controlled, and using the, the really nifty feature of Ensim called synthetic simulation on change, we can move these sliders, a new result will pop into view, and when I do this with people who haven't seen system dynamics before, it literally opens their eyes and often there are gasps in the room. They just haven't seen models used fast interactively to promote discussion. So this is the opening view of the long-term model that was developed for Ontario. When you <clears throat> initiate a modeling project, I was taught you have to pick the most important variable and draw a picture of how you think it will behave, and we call that picture the reference mode in our textbooks, in the literature. Sometimes we call it the target pattern. My Ontario colleagues selected the all-in price of electricity to the local distribution companies as the target. It's actually the sum of two rates, the GA or global adjustment rate in blue, and the average spot price, their spot market price in red. And this was the key variable selected as the measure of performance. And you can see we're simulating it over a 30-year period. Now, this particular measure 
does not bounce around much when you move the sliders left and right. It's a very sluggish variable that is difficult to move. So what we do when there are very small changes in the all-in price is we accumulate their effect over time to see the cumulative cost of power to the low distribution companies. And small changes in the key variable can lead to big value. I'll show you this example in more detail later. The value turns out to be 2,526 million, in other words, 2.5 billion in reduced costs. Now, I want to share a lesson for those of you who may be in the academic world like me and sometimes do practical applications of what we, what we know. And when you begin an engagement with clients, I was told that after you become familiar with their problem, the very most important thing you could do early on is work with them to define the reference mode or target pattern. And being an academic, I thought, well, I'll just tell the same story I tell in the classroom. Now, what we urge students to think about is general patterns. They may be exponential growth or exponential decay, perhaps S-shaped growth or an overshoot. We then pick a case study, at least I like case studies. My favorite is Mono Lake in uh, Northern California. And the, the reference mode showing the problem is a graph of the volume of water in that lake declining over a 100 year interval and that decline causes problems for the ecosystem in the Mono Basin. And then we usually show an improved pattern if you were to take policy steps like cutting exports of water to Los Angeles. And here is a possible picture of the improved pattern. <coughs> now, what did we do in the boardroom? Um, I used to just repeat to clients what I said in the classroom, and they kind of left it to me to draw the reference mode. And as a model developer, that exposes you to problems because you need to have agreement on what the target pattern is before you start building a model or you won't know what to build. So let me share something that worked well for me the last four or five times out. Um, usually the people in the room, it's not just one person, it's usually five or six, maybe 10 or 12 people. And I give the same speech I give in the classroom. And then just to see what happens, in one group of about 15 people working on watershed improvements, I said, take out a blank sheet of paper, and each of you will draw your own target pattern. Do not look at your neighbor, because I'll be watching closely to make sure no one's cheating. <clears throat> My advice was that on the horizontal axis, they put time. And feel free to let time be in any unit you want, minutes, hours, weeks, months. And the length of time can be anything you want. It can be seven days for a week. It could be 24 months to show a year. In long-term models, it's usually 10, 15, 20 years. Then turn to the vertical axis and pick a key variable of performance, often something that's performing badly, and draw a picture of that variable so that we all can look at that picture and say, yep, that's the problem we wish to solve. I give them that advice. I turn them loose. There's plenty of time. When they're all done, we'll invite people to come to the front of the room and present their reference modes. <coughs> What happened next was the biggest surprise I've ever seen in a group process. I have worked with groups that appeared to be marching in unison toward a model. They all agreed system dynamics was great. They loved the interactive software. They wanted to be collaborative in their work and involve stakeholders. The more people who contribute, the more learning, the better learning, the more likelihood they'll get to a conclusion that they all share. What a unified group, 
but what a diverse set of reference modes they drew on the board. Some people in this watershed project had a model that ran for 12 months to show the ups and downs in a reservoir. Others showed the temperature at a key point where the river violated uh, thermal standards, and that picture ran for 30 years because they wanted 30 years to build riparian vegetation to cool the river. And in the Ontario study, there was a similar diversity of views. Some people had a 20 or 30 year picture with the all-in price. Others had pictures of what might happen during a single day of operating the storage. Now, the dominant view in the Ontario study was that the modeler, that's me, should be set loose to build a long-term model. It would run for 30 years. 24-hour profiles would be maintained for a typical day in each month of the year. We would calculate spot prices, the global adjustment rate, and get the all-in price. But when they gave me this direction, a, a, a goal set by the dominant voices in the room, they knew that there was diversity of, of opinions about what would be useful. And that's great for the modeler because you've got your directive and you can proceed and try, do your best job building the long-term model. The eventual outcome that I want to share with you is that we didn't build a single model. We built a modeling system comprised of an operational model that ran for a single week with time and hours. The operations model was fed by assumptions that we used in the long-term model. We exercised the operational model to get performance measures, and then the performance measures were transferred back up to the long-term model as performance curves. And that set us up for a unified modeling system. I'm going to jump through some views so you can see the value of such a combination. <coughs> this is the long-term model. I'm emphasizing the wind generation in red. The ups and downs are seasonal averages that differ because some months are windier than others. Some days can be windier than others. As you see here, for a typical week in February, in which it's a windy Thursday, and when you have a very windy Thursday, you can get a lot of extra generation that leads to exports or curtailments, shown in orange. And there are the experts in curtailments. The exports are in blue. The curtailments are in red. Curtailments are an embarrassment for the electric power system. It means you have to shut down generators, and many of the must-run generators are must-run, must-pay. So curtailments are a problem, a surprising problem. It's basically too much generation. Now, I'm in the short-term model. The short-term model can show the curtailments, and you wouldn't see them in the long-term model. The key stock in the short-term model is energy storage. For example, if you want to avoid curtailments, you should turn on the pumps at the storage facility, and they'll put load on the system. The most familiar form of storage usage is called load leveling. You pump at night, you generate during the day, and in the process you create a more level load to be served. This is a view of the operations model where we ask for 1,000 megawatts of storage, of storage capacity. This is a compressed air, advanced compressed air facility that pumps air in at night releases it during the day. It uses a nearly isothermal process to avoid having to burn natural gas. We ask for 1,000 megawatts, and we can pump at night and generate during the day, and the cavern refills each day. Now, <coughs> I switched to the long-term model and showed one of the most important views. This is the entry to the OPA, the on Ontario Power Authority sector with a chart of the cash flows. Ontario generators receive payments, payments for hydro in blue, wind in red, nuclear in purple, green for natural gas, conservation in orange. 
The generators have an agreement to pay back to Ontario a portion of their spot revenues, and those cash flows are summed up blue for hydro, red for wind, purple for nuclear. And Ontario's net revenue requirements is the graph on the left minus the graph on the right. Now what I'm going to show you now is the simulated value of load leveling and the displacement of new combustion turbines as viewed in the cost impact screen shown previously. I'm going to ask for a 1,000 megawatt G-case facility. G-case is general compression, advanced energy storage. I'll make the standard assumption for efficiency, round trip efficiency. I have three choices. I'll pick the middle choice. We've learned that the best way to run the facility is only in the months of December, January, February, and August, the peak months of the year. And because we have peak generation, we can drop off some of the combustion turbines being added in the future. We'll drop off the 2021 edition by 1,000 megawatts. Hit the simulate button, 2.5 billion in value. Now that's pretty significant. That 2.1 should say 2.5. The team and the agencies agreed with this approximate result. And in fact, the fact that we gave them this value, it's kind of low, built confidence that we were not trying to fudge the results, that the model looked reasonable. But we don't have enough value of storage. And the answer for the additional value is in the wind. Every time you see pictures of storage, you often see a windmill right next door. These are windmills in uh, the south of Spain. They need to be integrated into the system. And for integration, we mean the forecasted wind and the actual wind have to be brought into balance. And in this graph, I'm showing wind generation in blue, Scheduled wind, which comes from the forecast, in red. <coughs> and what you see in this graph is that the wind in blue is too low relative to the forecast. When this happens, you need extra generation, so we run the generators at the storage facility. When the wind is sh shooting up, the wind happens to be too high, and you need less generation or more load. These so-called decremental reserves can be provided by running the pumps at the compressed air facility. This is a picture of performing this service in the weekly operations model. We're doing January of 2028, and the red curve shows running the generators. The blue curve shows running the pumps, and the final result is essentially 90% wind integration. Now, what we do is we take that result back up to the long-term model, and a big question is, what is the dollars per megawatt hour value of performing wind integration? Our best estimate is this middle curve. We have, everybody agrees that when the first bit of wind capacity enters the system, it'll essentially be a free service to integrate wind. That red dot is a strong benchmark value from Bonneville. We've estimated the upper limit at $15 a megawatt hour. Other people say you're way too high. Some people say you're too low. So we have three different curves. And when we run the model, the user can pick low, medium, or high value curves. And we've, in this example, picked a 1,000 megawatt G case and the total value with the middle curve climbs to 5.1 billion. Now what we do is we show total value, which is of course the strongest figure of interest to the entrepreneurial development who hired me to do this work. If we do load leveling and when load leveling and capacity term at displacement in four months of the year, the value would be just over $2 billion. And if we do wind integration in the other um, months of the year, we get $5 billion. 
total value exceeds seven billion, and that, my friends, is a substantial value that exceeds the likely cost of bulk energy storage. The end result of these curves was um, <coughs> considerable learning amongst the team that built the model and the agencies who sent staff to participate in the briefings. We had multiple briefings with staff members coming back, sometimes three or four times, and as they came back, they saw a model that kept growing and improving based on their input. So they saw large value numbers, and they saw a process that engaged them so that we all learned together. The upshot of the seven billion and all the learning was that they're going forward with uh, storage procurement. I want to conclude with advice for practitioners, um, especially those of you who are like me, you're an academic, and you're wondering uh, when you get asked to do a practical study, what, <laughs> what's the best advice for entering the practical world of consulting when your background is entirely academic and as a professor? One thing I learned from the Ontario study and from previous studies is the value of having people draw the reference mode individually, show them and have this discovery that there's a tremendous diversity of opinion about what the target pattern for the model should be. I think it's useful to invite multiple views at the beginning because it's best to reveal the differences among the team early. If you if you don't define the reference mode and you go off and build what you think you should build, there will always be two-thirds of the people in the room who will be unhappy because they had some pattern in mind. If you get those patterns all out in view at the very beginning, they'll discover that there's lots of different dynamics of interest to them, and they have to pick one to, to focus on. Now, in the end, you might benefit, as we did in Ontario, from a combination of models working together. So in our case, our learning almost jumped into high gear when we, when we built the operations model and linked it to the planning model. Suddenly, the discussions exploded because we were talking about topics of interest to both long-term planners and the people who are trying to decide how to run the storage facility. Now, if you go in this direction, take note that the connections between the two models are conceptual, not computer coding. I happen to not, I do not advocate that if you have hourly dynamics, which is what's going on in our operations model, the last thing you want to do is have a long-term planning model where your time is in hours and your DT might be one hour or a quarter of a model. <coughs> a far better approach is to learn from the operations model. For example, I'll point to one of the, uh, this box here. Learn from the operations model the best hours of the evening to pump and the best hours of the day to generate. And when you get a big profile, transfer that profile up to the long-term model. If you learn that you can get 90% wind integration early in the years, but later you may only get 85%, create a performance curve and transfer that up to the planning model. In other words, learn something from the short-term model and transfer your learning to the long-term model. That worked well for us in Ontario, and I think it, it's a generic, um, it, it, it isn't limited to electric utilities. We've advocated doing this for national park planning, and I'm sure in the situations you face, it, it may definitely occur to you that you could build a combination of models and have more success with your clients. Well, thank you for your attention and turn over the meeting for discussion. Hello? Now, any questions? Hi, Andy. This is Marcel.
Uh, Hi, Marciano. And I'm glad that you are here. And uh, we are talking about a, uh, a similar problem we have in Brazil, as you probably know, that we uh, are developing in very fast uh, a very large uh, wind farm uh, uh, generation system. Uh, we have problems in Brazil because uh, there will be enough uh, reservoir space to save the, the energy when it's not needed. On the other hand, we, we also have to, to have very fast uh, generation plants to, to, uh, to cover the when the wind is stops or uh, the, the wind speed reduces. Uh, do you think that this model could be uh, a similar model could be developed for our, our conditions, taking account that we have reservoirs, high uh, power, and, and the large reservoirs that could save a lot of this energy? Uh, I think it would be very useful for us. Uh, this is the first uh, question. And second question is, uh, I have been recently in a, in a workshop that people is, is intending to uh, re review, revisit the uh, reversible uh, plans in Brazil. There's a lot of place to, to build them uh, for several reasons, but one of them would be, of course, to store this energy. And, and, and so, I would ask you if you think that it would be very as efficient as that uh, the use of uh, 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 reversible plants for this purpose. These are two questions. And as, as the system is now with the hydro reservoir and as, the, uh, as this, and uh, in the future we, uh, we could be developed some uh, 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 reversible Proper storage, I mean, the proper storage uh, would be additional, uh, would bring the additional benefits for the system. Thank you, Marciano. I'm glad you were able to attend, and it's nice to see you right in the front row. Um, you're looking good. Um, However, there's an echo in your in your voice when I hear it, so I'm going to ask Kareem, whose voice I can hear more clearly. Kareem, could you repeat or summarize the first question, and then we'll and then do that again later for his second question. Um, Andy, his first question was just about um, whether your model could be adapted to be used in Brazil to help them to decide how to uh, use wind wind power and whether or not to implement storage. <laughs> the, so, Marciano, the, the main thing that occurs to me when I think about Brazil is that you have a huge potential for pump storage. Um, my friends in Ontario, they do operate a pump storage facility on the Niagara River, um, but they don't have further sites, so it would pro you with your huge hydro potential, especially that Itapu Dam that you know so well, you have the capability to provide uh, energy storage, perhaps not just for Brazil, but for an, a more interconnected system in all of South America. And um, yes, this modeling method would be useful. I heard you mention fast acting dynamics and I'm going to go out on the limb that you're interested in models that might run with time in minutes rather than in hours. And just to let you know, one of our graduate students, Tyler Llewellyn, built a model of the pump storage facility on the Columbia. It's located at Grand Coulee Dam. And his model did wind integration with pump storage with time in minutes. And what we did is we looked at Tyler's model and created proxy data for our Ontario study where our model runs in hours and his ran in minutes. So yes, the method could be adapted to um, 
to Brazil, and I suspect your focus would probably be more on pump storage rather than the advanced uh, underground storage uh, method that drew interest in Ontario. And Kareem, what was the, your summary of the second question? Uh, sinto muito, Marciano. Infelizmente, eu não ouvi bem também. Okay. Uh, Indeed, uh, you, uh, you just answered both questions, okay? Uh, but there is a, uh, I have another one, if you can answer it. Yeah. Uh, uh, the reason is, any storage, public uh, storage or uh, advanced air, compressed uh, air, and other, are really uh, net uh, lows, not, not generators. So, this is a, a problem uh, under the regulatory uh, point of view. Uh, uh, how to, to, to recover this cost? For, if you invest in, in, uh, in storage, a public storage, for example, uh, it should be very difficult to decide how to pay it for a service. Because it's a net uh, load, not a generator, because uh, you have losses in the pumping process. Uh, although there are gains in, in the overall system, uh, this, how how do you deal or if you if you have that uh, this your uh, 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 position in this study you did with the on time uh, the regulatory uh, framework how how it has to evolve it is not the the, the one we have now if you cannot have a, Okay, Kareem, can you summarize? There's still a difficult echo for me in listening. Yes, here as well. But my understanding was, um, you can correct me, Marciano, if I'm wrong. My understanding was, um, how do you deal with the costs of operating these systems, the costs associated with pumping uh, in and out, and how those affect things? Is that correct, Marciano? point is, uh, how, how do you recover the costs uh, under our current regulatory uh, framework, uh, the pump the storage or any other storage uh, technology is a net load for the system. So uh, it, it does not recover the costs based on the current uh, rate making process. So how, how is this uh, kind of uh, facility being dealt with from the point of view of uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, st structure. This is the, the question. It's not a generator in an, uh, it, because it is, uh, this efficiency of the pumping is always not one, of course. Uh, and uh, so you have some losses and uh, uh, as you pump and you generate you uh, you are really taking load from the system, not generating anything. So uh, this is a uh, although we understand that this is a benefit for the system, it's not. To, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this is the concept of pumper storage associated with nuclear plants because you normally you you pump during the uh, the night when the rates are very low and you generate in the peak hours when the, the rates are high. So you, 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 you save energy at a low cost and sell it uh, at a high cost. But the problem is that in Brazil for a hydro system there is no large difference between peak load and uh, low load or intermediate load. It's very small difference so that you not does not uh, pay the difference. Uh, I, I think I, I could make the point more clearly now. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you, Marciano. That separate microphone helped a lot. Um, your questions have been asked in Ontario as well. Um, what some of the confusion is how to describe storage because it's not a generator and it's not a load when you pump. It's both pumping and generation. Um, there is many discussions of flexibility of the power system, and some regions are issuing flexibility targets. And one of the interesting things about a a storage facility like underground storage is it can provide both pumping and generation. And when you're trying to do a performance like wind integration, you can deliver wind integration with a 1,000 megawatt compressed air facility that matches what a 2,000 megawatt generator can do. It's twice as valuable. Now, as people discover these values, they then ask how to monetize the benefits so that the developer can cover their costs and earn a profit. The standard recommendations I hear are that you estimate the value. Um, let's say the value is seven billion. You negotiate the contracts with potential developers and let's say you offer them uh, five billion for a big facility and you see if they sign the procurement contract. And the payment would typically take the form of a uh, capacity payments, where you get uh, an annual or monthly payment based on the capacity of the generators at the facility, because everyone's used to talking about generators. If the developer signs the contract, you know that they're earning a sufficient profit to sign. Uh, and then, the operation of the facility might be turned, if it's bulk storage, might be turned over to the independent system operator. A whole different issue is customer side storage, which I don't think you mentioned. That is exploding in California as people put storage in to help shape their photovoltaic generation. And system dynamics can be valuable there as well. Just to let you know, a young student, his name is Bill Grace, He's studying at WPI, so Kareem probably knows him. Bill Grace just published a report in Southwest Australia on the use of battery storage that homeowners would use to reshape their demands and their cost of electricity. So your good question about how to monetize the benefits. Regulators and entrepreneurs are all struggling with this question uh, in Ontario and elsewhere. I think capacity payments coupled with a procurement process um, will be the answer. Hello, Andy. Um, nice to nice to see you here with us. Actually, not see you, but hear you. I hope you get better from your cold soon. Um, I have a practical question. Um, I think Marciano, among others, would love to have you come uh, help us do some work here in Brazil at some point in time. And my question is, if there was an opportunity to to come and in and build upon some of the work you've done, uh, but applying it more specifically to our needs. Um, what are some of your thoughts about um, whether to uh, develop models from, from scratch, uh, working closely with uh, the users, the clients, um, as opposed to uh, taking uh, some of the work that you've done in the past and uh, doing simulation labs with them, extracting insights, um, and then if they're still interested, uh, developing models later as a, as a second step to this process. Thanks, Aldo. And Aldo, thanks for coming to the microphone. It was very clear. Um, and thanks for thinking about a visit to Brazil. That would sound like a good idea. When I meet new clients, 
who have a general interest in system dynamics, many of them have maybe heard of systems thinking or systems modeling, but they just know glancingly about it. If these are people that you've dealt with or Marciano has dealt with, they probably know it already. And But most of the people I've encountered are glancingly familiar, and when, when I get involved with them, it all starts with a phone call. And I say, oh, hello, yes, this is Andy Ford. Um, yes, I do work on the energy industry. Oh, you'd like to have a model of some problem? Well, let's talk about it. When we sit down to talk, I do show them a previous model so they can see what we mean by sensitivity testing, interactive simulation, policy tests. I may show some stocks and flows. And then when they have a more concrete understanding, they can say, that's very interesting. I haven't seen models run that fast before or that clearly before. Our situation is very different. Would it be possible to simulate with the same approach uh, the differences in our system? And then you get down to brass tacks about um, how much time will it take and how much money do they have and who's going to share with you how the system works. Um, the key in all this is, is how they staff such exercises. To someone who really, does someone who really knows how the system works, are they willing to tell you the inner details we need to put into a system dynamics model? If they staff it well, then you can I would build from an existing model that has structure that has proven valuable in the past. In many of my studies, I haven't started from scratch. Um, I'd say maybe only a third of them do I hear a, a problem and I have to start totally from scratch. The majority of the cases are like the Ontario study where it builds from previous applications. Now, Aldo, there was, I think, more to your question that I didn't answer, so press me to be complete if you think I've come up short. That's our part. Uh, we thank you very much for your presentation. It was very clear. I think you answered all the questions. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.